um, for the tuberculosis center, they decided it would be nice to excavate a pond um, so that uh, it would be like peaceful and you know beautiful. So there wasn't a pond here. There was probably a stream that then met the Chicago River, but a pond was um, excavated. Um, then obviously there was buildings that were built and then some of those buildings were demolished. There was formal landscape that um, you could imagine like green grass. Uh, road constructions and dem dem demolitions after that. So the, the land has been changing since, you know, since that time. Um, and so that will then impact what can you restore or imagine for a preserve here in Chicago. Um, so here's another image of that tuberculosis um, sanitarium and you can see there's still a lot of green greenery and remnants from the nursery so some of those older trees um, big open space for leisure um, and it was a really pretty um, kind of like still secluded area um, uh, on uh, uh, on Chicago's borders um, and um, so so it was um, a, an idea of well, how can we take that existing land and turn it into a preserve? And that really became something that communities fought for. They uh, had conversations in the city, like, should we build some condos? Should we build a complex? Um, but people really said, no, it's been a really beautiful sanctuary. Let's preserve that. Um, and so from there, um, there was uh, an agreement with the city to then have this um, easement where we turned it into um, a nature preserve. Um, the questions there became, let's keep the green space um, and, and let's kind of start forming these plots. So here you start seeing a little bit more like, like a plot um, in the north part. Um, and um, soon it became something that you can see the pond. We had designated areas. And how did we know how to designate what would go where? We did some soil testing, some initial plant surveys, what was living where. Um, but we really came to the idea, and I keep saying we, because I wasn't around back then, thank good. I, I'm glad to be a little bit young, hopefully. But um, we uh, came to this plan of restoration and stewardship. So um, the idea was that, well, yeah, there's a lot of problems with hydrology, the soil, um, and the vegetation. So what can be done? Why don't we focus on like how the land was and then see what we can turn that into. So the pond area became a wetland. The open land area, we decided to do a prairie. Um, and not necessarily that there was a prairie right here in this space, but the idea is to then have this education space and model to talk about prairies, since prairies were um, one of the major habitats uh, in Illinois. Um, then where there's more trees and a little bit of open space, we decided to do an oak savanna. So our nature preserve right here in Chicago is a demonstration of four different Midwestern ecosystems right in 46 acres. So it's pretty neat to be able to go to a place and see these different ecosystems right in your neighborhood. Um, and so I think that that's one thing that makes us unique and special. Um, this next image shows it a little bit more in a grid. Um, I know you can't see the legend, but um, it is the distinct four areas. And I'll talk a little bit about how we've managed that. Um, uh, we have a land management plan uh, that has changed over time. We're um, obviously following Chicago Wilderness Best Practices, Illinois Land Management, um, Chicago Park District's uh, policies and procedures. And so um, one of the things that you'll hear often is that it's necessary to remove um, invasive species. Um, and so we, we did have a sense of what size did the trees have to be um, in order for us to remove them, where they were located. So you got to remember, we're in a city and we've got these major roads. Um, we even have a um, 
a fire engine house like on the, on the corner right out, outside of the preserve. So we've got these major roads that we thought would be helpful to have some kind of buffer. Um, and uh, so some of the trees that were along the borders weren't necessarily removed. It was like a buffer for like sound pollution. And also just so when you're here, you kind of feel like you're in um, this sanctuary, not necessarily, you know, looking behind the trees and seeing the cars and the fire trucks pass by. Um, and um, the other thing is spreading native plant seeds. Um, so in continuing this process. So these were just kind of like some major um, land management goals. Um, I want to show you some amazing kind of before and after pictures. These are not exactly the same exact spot or, you know, I don't have necessarily dates of when these pictures were taken. I want you to just kind of get an idea of how um, the preserve has changed. So I'll start with our woodland. Um, so our wetland has um, um, been restored since um, the 1930s. There, uh, I'm sorry, 1995, there was a big restoration on the pond that was installed in the 1930s. So this is probably uh, the 1995 pictures. And um, you can imagine, like, what would you expect to live um, at a wetland? Um, um, throw some of those, um, like, species out there. You can tell me about, like, what lives in the water, what lives, um, what comes and stops and drinks. So you guys thinking about what lives at a wetland? Okay. So um, we definitely had... Um, some uh, um, species here already, but you can imagine when you restore something, what it would look like afterwards. And what that process entails is um, lots of machines and digging, people planting. I mean, I think we planted, what is like the number? I think it was like 17,000 uh, wetland plants. Um, and then, we, you know, here's this little cute example here. Um, so it was a long process, but then you can see how, how the wetland would look after. So I personally think that these are really great, like before and after pictures and examples of like how we've managed um, the land through restoration and, and stewardship. So now I want to show you the other areas. So remember we had four. So here's the wetland. Next is prairie. Here's um, some of our prairie uh, in front of the building. Um, we wanted to um, put some uh, prairie plants there. And um, we do a lot of work in terms of seed collecting and seed processing. I mentioned um, um, that every year we're probably putting seeds out there. And then here's like a prairie after. So um, it really does make an impact and a difference. Um, let's see what we've got next. We have woodlands before. Here we have a lot of dense vegetation. Um, one of our invasives is buckthorn, which pretty much takes over. They um, are super invasive that they really don't allow any other um, shrubs and vegetation on the bottom, you can kind of see that. Um, and so some of the work that our volunteers do, which I have to say, this nature center has been really driven by the work of volunteers, as you can see through my pictures. We've got over 100 dedicated volunteers per year um, that come Wednesdays and Sundays. Um, we take uh, teens as volunteers. Um, sometimes we work with uh, companies and um, community centers to come and volunteer. But here's an example of what they're doing. So on the bottom, they're cutting this buckthorn. Then there's a pile, a brush pile that we're going to burn. But we also do some really neat work with buckthorn. We have created these fences on the preserve using the buckthorn. Um, and then the bottom picture there is this cute um, 
dear that my, one of my team members, Sean, he, he made it. So there's a lot of woodworking and um, making um, toys with buckthorn. We call it buckthorn bling. So you can put it around your neck and have a little name tag made out of buckthorn. So I think that that's another really good way that we're combining what we're doing in terms of restoration with education and making the link for people who live in the city. So um, that's Woodlands and uh, show you the Woodland after with all of this clearing. This might actually be one of our Savannah pictures. I'm not fully sure, but um, it, it really does make a difference when we've, once we've cleaned this, the space out. Um, we have um, another Savannah picture. Um, that also has a lot of buckthorn. And I can see how um, we've got a question about controlling buckthorn. Uh, and uh, I would have to say that um, my colleague Bob is not here, and he's been working here for 20 years. Um, I'm sure they've tried uh, several different things. I can find out um, what his tips are in terms of um, Buckthorn, and I can post that back to the the group. Um, there, there is um, a lot of um, techniques that people have been trying, but really, it is a thing that you have to just kind of continuously work on. Um, and our uh, crew has also um, removed trees and then planted trees. So here they are. Uh, planting and these small trees that have been planted are some oak trees um, which um, are important um, for for this area um, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges so we already pointed out buckthorn um, and I'm gonna come back to it again um, and uh, I think that um, What's interesting is that, you know, we're uh, a nature preserve within the city. So where's like this balance? You know, we, you get people who talk about like, oh, yeah, there's nature in the city. But then people are like, well, you know what? People need um, experiences in um, like a larger acreage. Like people really need to get away. Um, and this uh, idea of access and public space and opportunity. Um, there's also the idea of... Are people losing their connection to nature? Or are we already connected? We just don't realize how we've connected. Are we missing some of these histories um, from like our, our parents and grandparents of the way things are? are? You know, are we moving too fast and not being able to catch up and slow down? So I mentioned before that my parents are from Michoacan, Mexico, and there's definitely a lot of stories um, that I'll hear from my mom that, you know, they lived in a ranch, they uh, work closely with, um, with the animals and plants there. So some of these traditions have to continue being part of our urban experience, even if um, they're not necessarily the experiences that we're living today. Um, so our preserve has some challenges that I just kind of mentioned a little bit of like the education piece. Um, but people, you know, are, are a challenge. Um, so we kind of have to understand that challenge. And so, um, and not necessarily just all uh, look at it in a negative way. But when we have lots of people who are visiting, I'm, I mean, we're talking about sometimes um, moving um, off of trail. Um, you know, we, you know, we have signs all about like not littering or, or you know, picking or taking um, and maintaining the space. But um, sometimes that can also just kind of like the signage be like way in your face and takes from your experience. So. Um, just even people who are visiting, how many people can we take per day? You know, when we have field trips, we've got a lot of a lot of kids coming at once. So these are just some questions that we're always thinking of. Um, the Nature Center is also really cool because we have um, what we call nature play spaces. So 
this is um, a space that is kind of dedicated towards that. So if you want, you kind of want to go off the trail. You kind of want to touch, you know, the branches and build on them and be creative and imagine, imaginative. You want to, you know, make a mud pies. You want to splash in the puddles. I mean, this is um, bringing things down back to play, and. Um, we have uh, uh, 12 acres that's dedicated to this. Uh, we call it Walking Stick Woods. Um, and it's an amazing space. One of our Boy Scouts groups has built um, this little like um, tree house that you see here in the pictures. We've got some tire swings, but we're not necessarily like planning and designing that. You all are, or the, the children are. I mean, that's kind of the, the idea is that this next generation can enjoy nature, manipulate uh, their spaces, and think about their environments and, and make that connection. Um, so kids will come and make a fort one day. They might come and uh, take off the fort another day. So who's ever moving through this space, um, they get to have that experience. And remember, I showed you the picture with the snow. So we... Um, um, have nature play going on in the snow too. You know, if it's a really wet, rainy day, all you have to do is, you know, put on some boots and a, and a raincoat, you know. So it's about having these types of experiences all year long. Um, so even though it, it can be a challenge, we should be looking at it um, as an opportunity. Uh, the other challenge that I want to go back to is again this inv invasive species. So besides buckthorn, we also have garlic mustard um, that has been an issue. Um, I mean, we have more than, you know, these, these two or three listed. Uh, but i just like to point out a few. I mean, we even have um, poison ivy um, that we only manage in certain places and not others. Um, we have this bottom bug here um, uh, is an emerald ash borer. And so this has been um, a huge concern for us because we have uh, um, a lot of ash trees that have had to have been removed because of the emerald ash borer. Um, and so luckily we have um, stewards and partnerships with other city agencies who have helped us um, with removing of these trees, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's a continuous concern um, for us. Um, and as we're removing the ashes, we're planting some, um, some oaks. Um, and so um, we've, we've, it's just kind of like this um, continued land management plan that we have um, the other thing that um, I want to talk about as a challenge is some, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to call it as misconceptions. Um, so I guess what do I mean by that is um, some things that we don't understand fully or we have an idea um, of what it is, but we really are um, seeing what we hear in the media or, or maybe we just don't fully um, have an idea or have been uh, had an opportunity to um, understand these concepts better. And so um, I put up two examples here. One is, so the to uh, top, uh, the left is prescribed burn ahead. So we do um, some prescribed burns. Actually, we're hoping to do one um, on Sunday this weekend. Um, dependent on the weather. It's always dependent on the weather. If it's too wet, we can't do it. If it's too windy, we can't do it. Um, and we have to uh, alert and uh, let everybody um, know, like all our neighbors, um, um, all the people who are around this area know that we're doing a prescribed burn, giving them the heads up. Um, it's controlled. Um, we have the licenses to do it. Um, again, my land, uh, land manager here, he's been here for 20 years. Um, so a lot of people might not know what that is. You know, they think it's a fire. They don't know that there's training. Um, they also might have concerns um, about asthma and, you know, the smoke and is, is that the 
the best practice, you know, whether it, it's something that we should just let the, you know, the plants do on their own and uh, versus a human coming in and doing that. Um, and, and the asthma, you know, um, concerns, you know, if you think about just like the particles that go into the air, it's um, a small amount for a limited of time. It's not necessarily um, a huge issue as compared to, for example, if you were out there with a lawnmower and how much um, time that is um, contributing to like particles um, in the air. And, um, you know, the other thing is that um, fire was always um, something that was part of a prairie's um, process. And so um, it helps, you know, with um, the regrowth and healthiness of, of this prairie areas. So again, you know, all of this is a little bit of, you know, complex kind of um, explanation, but it, hel it helps for people to understand so that um, people can better be okay with, you know, what um, what's, um, are some of the challenges that we have. The picture on the right is a coyote, and that is pretty cool for um, a Chicago urban area. Um, Chicago actually has been doing a lot of research um, on coyotes. Um, the other day, uh, I would say maybe two weeks and a half ago, I was working late and I kept hearing like this barking and I'm like sitting at my desk and I was like, wow, they're really close. I need to go check them out. And so I, I went and I was like looking at the doors and I was trying to see where they were. And sure enough, I opened the door and they heard me and they ran um, not right at the door. It was a it was a two um, and they looked at me and then they just kept going. But um for some people, that's a very scary thing, you know, to think about that we have coyotes in the city. Um, and people will ask us, you know, what should you do? You know, do you, you know, do, do people come in and take them and take them somewhere else? Um, but pretty much, I mean, like coyotes are are not necessarily going to do anything to, you know, a human if they see them. It, you know, it's just best if you see them, just kind of walk away or, you know, just um you know, they'll probably just, you know, keep on going by. Um, and um, so I think that just, you know, this the fear element um, is something that um, has to be talked about in terms of nature and especially in the city area. Uh, so that's why here at the Nature Center, we do some nature at night experiences. So uh, during the um, certain seasons. We have the Nature Center open up until 8 p.m. Um, sometimes we'll have an owl prowl and we'll go out on a hike looking for owls. Um, we'll also talk about bats. Um, and it's really an experience to be out here and comfortable. Um, and we, you know, sometimes we do a lot of flashlights. It's okay. So it, it helps again for people to better um, be acquainted and comfortable with the nature that you have right here um, within the city. Um, the other challenge that I wanted to talk about um, is deer. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> So the cool thing about deer is that it's cool to see a deer when you're here in Chicago. Um, and so oftentimes people come to the nature preserve and they want to see the deer and they'll ask us like, where's your deer? Or if they're, you know, they um, are, you know, sometimes they cross the road and people will be like, hey, there's one of your deers out here. So we don't um, like the coyotes. We don't we don't manage the deer. Um, they, we are um, managing the, the land and the space, but um, the deer are probably coming from these larger, denser um, forests that um, are in the area, and they're just kind of flooding their way into the city. Um, and so um, folks are like, "Well, what's the problem?" So the problem is when you're trying to have a nature preserve and you're trying to grow all these native plants and species, the deer can really eat that pretty fast. They also um, can have, um, they'll also mate and um, populate. And so we're not just talking about like one deer, it'll be lots of deer. Um, we have had, um, I think about like for the last 10 years, we've done some 
kind of deer studies. We partner with some of the local universities and some college students, and we'll kind of do like a deer census, like a deer count, just to see how many deer um, are here on that given day. We try to do it around the same day um, every year. So sometime um, in winter, I think it was in December, like the first week of December, and we all had our coats and we were walking through the snow. And what we did was we formed like this really big line. Imagine like if you're with your friends and you're all holding hands and you're in the line all across the preserve and you're walking like forward and every time you see a deer, and, um, you have to count it. But only one person gets to count that deer because then we're counting the deer multiple times. And so we get this deer count. Uh, and then we look at those numbers and we kind of think about it. So I think this last deer count we had was um, 14 deer. And um, I think some other times it's been around 20s. Um, it's, you know, then you have to think about like, is this the most scientifically accurate? Well, what if the deer was just outside our nature preserve that day? Um, so it's, it, it gives us a baseline idea. Um, but when we're talking about 20 deer, for 46 acres, when you do the math about like you know how much they eat um, and how much space uh, they they need, um, it really should be closer to like one deer, <laughs> one deer here, not 20. So it's kind of interesting um, that people want to see them, but um, it's 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 a challenge for you know being a preserve. Um, and the pictures that I have here um, is, you know, is, is making this little point that we have is a deer exclosure. So we are have we have some spaces that we're excited about. We want to pilot and see what can grow in this space without the deer. So we have this fenced area. We're calling it Shangri-La, um, and then we also have another fenced area that's new and exciting to us, it's called a pollinator garden. And again, we have this deer exclosure. Um, and so I think uh, um, it, it's something that it's an ongoing conversation. Um, so um, I, I do see that there's questions about um, restoration bans and um, the Cook County. And so I think that that's something um, that again, we can uh, look into and let folks know. Um, it can be a sensitive and controversial topic into and let folks know. Um, it can be a sensitive and controversial topic, but again, I think that's what environmental education is all about, you know, having these conversations. So um, we'll be sure to find some more information um, on that. Um, the next slide, um, is um, now um, getting into a little bit of, well, we've talked about the challenges, but what about some success stories? Um, how do we know what we're doing matters? Um, what can we do in terms of monitoring and seeing um, the impact that we have? Uh, and we have these monitoring plots that have identified. Uh, we have, um, you know, changed things around a bit. Um, we're working with um, other partners that do have cameras here. So I'm, I showed you the picture of the coyote that was with um, a camera that we had um, here that was helping monitor. Um, but we have had projects um, that really help us understand the biodiversity that's here at the Nature Preserve. Um, the very early, early projects um, go way back uh, into the uh, 80s where people were doing um, bird counts um, here. And so I wanted to throw in these numbers, even though this is like a long time ago, way before a lot of you were born. Um, it's interesting to look at this. Is One is that there's always been this um, concerned community and this involved community. Um, and they've been um, counting and, and trying to see what uh, um, species were here. And so you can see in 88, uh, we had about 89, 81. Um, then it went down a little bit into the 60s. Um, for those of you who uh, like science and these, and these graphs, I mean, you can make a really cool graph out of these data. But um, what I wanted to point out is then, remember that wetland restoration that I mentioned in 1995? Well, look at that change. I mean, look at how much that changed 
um, just with having this wetland restoration. Because now we are talking about having different types of, of ducks who are visiting. Um, we've had, you know, we have wood ducks, we have um, great blue herons, and so we have the green herons. And so we have um, all of these uh, different kinds of um, species of, of birds that will be impacted when you're um, making an impact on their habitat basically. So if we're, you know, we um, have prairies, then we'll have more species that um, that live in prairies. So um, these numbers only go up until 2005. That doesn't mean that we don't have data after that, because we do. But um, this, I felt like, would show you the, the difference in, in just those given uh, periods. So bird counting has been going on um, a long time um, um, at this at this nature center. Um, I am um, not fully the, a birder yet, but I take pictures um, at our bird feeders all the time. I mean, they're pretty cool. We've got, you know, we've got some hawks. We've got, you know, the woodpeckers who are out right now in this, um, you know, cold. We've got some juncos, um, blue jays. So, I, I mean, it's really cool to have that experience when you're like, whoa, I never saw this bird um, in Chicago. And we're like, yeah, you got to just, you know, look up in the trees, you know. So, um, they're here. And I think that's, that's really special. Um, besides the birds, we um, have been doing um, dragonfly uh, monitor monitoring, butterfly monitoring. Um, it's really driven by some of the volunteers and who's really into something. Um, and th there's a lot of um, networks in Chicago wilderness and resources to do some of that monitoring. Um, and so what I wanted to point out, though, here is that at the Nature Center, we've done a lot of more uh, work specifically around monarchs. And um, some of our staff have gone to um, trainings. Um, we're rearing monarchs here on site. Um, so um, what that means is we'll go around the preserve, we'll collect the eggs, we'll watch them um, through the caterpillar stage, the chrysalis stage, and then the butterfly stage. Um, once they're in butterflies, we'll put out this net um, out um, in our prairie section. And so it's like a big tent. And so we'll allow the butterflies to be out there um, feeding on the nectar from our, our prairie right here. And then um, we have a big festival called Monarch Palooza. Um, and people come out to that. Um, but when people come to us, they're like, oh, how can I do this at home? And we have lots of stories of people who are doing this, too. And maybe some of you guys know people who are doing this or you are interested in doing it. Um, but it is a really special thing to do, to watch them go through all their stages. Um, and uh, um, sometimes people will bring back them um, at the butterfly stage because what we do is we tag them and then these butterflies will um, start their migration. Uh, and if they're found, someone can use the data from their tags to know like where they started and where they've been flying through to better understand their, um, their migration. Um, and guess where they're going? Michoacan, Mexico. So that is something near and dear. Um, I, did, I did go to the Monarch Sanctuary in Michoacan. Um, as a teen, I remember. Um, so some some of my uh, family members will tell me like stories and the myths and things around it. Um, so it it is another um, opportunity to not just you know monitor, but then there's the like the education piece as well. Um, so that's um, the monarchs. The other thing that I wanted to mention um, is so I mentioned we had some night cameras um, that would take pictures when there's movement. We also have some bat monitoring. So um, it's picking up um, echolocation and then some um, scientists and experts can identify the species um, based on this monitoring. And what's pretty awesome is that seven species right here in the nature preserve have been undocumented through this bat monitoring. Um, we have big brown bats, eastern red bats, I mean, you can see the list here, but most people are like, 
wait a minute, we have bats in Chicago, and then seven different species, and then again, this is another species where people are like concerned about, they uh, have misconceptions, they don't really, you know, understand them, and so it's a great um, educational opportunity for us to talk about. Um, and so, um, and then there's also, in terms for, um, for bats um, and their um, biodiversity and some of the concerns, I mean, I, I wrote a little bit of information about concerns with the white nose syndrome. So it's really great to see those particular bats up here, um, especially with those concerns there. Um, again, um, I am excited that I'm uh, more of the, um, um, like, uh, environmental science like leadership and education, um, not fully uh, the scientist who knows all the ins and outs, but I think it's uh, important to bridge both worlds um, and pointing out informal science education um, as a way that's doing that. Um, and so um, this this is a, a really good example of real science, that, science that's going on um, and how we are communicating that back to the community. Um, just have a couple more slides here. Um, there, I mean, we also have like, um, we work with partners from the Chicago Turtle Club. We have um, people, you know, from the Herb Society who are connected to us. So we do have frog monitoring. Um, there are uh, snakes that we've seen out here. Um, and so um, it really it really gives people that, that sense of, um, of nature right in, in the city. Uh, this is um, just some of my pictures for fun um, because um, I wanted to point out the tiniest creatures that we don't we don't see or, or think about um, and I've really become much more observant you know start, um, since I've been working here um, and these are like things that I never saw you know while, I, while I've been here in, in Chicago all my life um, but the top uh, left one was pretty cute because it's like so tiny and then when it closes its wings, those little black edges on his wings, it looks like pinchers, um, kind of like a little crab walking around wanting to pinch you. But it's really this, you know, cute little bug It's little um, um, with its wings that makes it like mimic like that. Um, and then we have these underwing moths. Um, that maybe you'll just see the moth side, but if you take the time to look, um, it opens its uh, bottom underneath wing and it's like red and beautiful. Um, there's uh, this like see-through bug that was on the wall the other day, this great um, caterpillar picture, you know, in the middle of the leaves. Um, and so I think that these are, these are just, you know, in just a couple of you know, um, months that I've been here, uh, and I'm not necessarily out there going to look for bugs, like, they're here, and the next thing I know, that I'm, like, seeing them, and they're in my face, um, and paying attention to the tiny little things, um, and that we would have normally not, uh, paid attention to, so, um, I, um, I hope that, um, you guys enjoyed my, urban nature talk, um, all about North Park Village Nature Center, um, really passionate about um, environmental education and especially reaching Chicago audiences and underserved audiences. Um, it doesn't matter um, what your background or what zip code you're in, what neighborhood. Um, I think that access to nature is important, um, representation, um, diversity, and you know what I you know I'm glad to have had this um, experience I'm thankful for um, Elgin High School students extending the opportunity because I think it's cool for people um, especially in high school and when you're young to see you know that um, I was you too you know um, that was me you know in a Chicago public high school starting to like nature a little bit but not really sure didn't know i can do that as a career um and so i think that that that's um something that i'm um really passionate about and thankful um for elgin high school to invite me in this national biodiversity teaching i think it's amazing what you guys are doing i also want to thank my colleagues um who um, work with me here at the nature center we have two amazing naturalists and our land manager who helped me with um, the content and the slides. Um, I have an amazing team in Chicago 
who represent the natural areas department, um, who can tell you all about the rest of the Chicago natural areas, um, which yes, we have more here in Chicago. Um, so if we have further questions, feel free, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, um, including my email here. Um, I did see there was some questions on the chat box um, and I'd be happy to follow up with folks. Um, and uh, um, if, and if anybody has any other questions, you know, you can put them uh, last remaining questions or questions about my my path or information. Um, definitely look up our website, um, North Park Village Nature Center. Check out our walking stick woods. Um, and if you want to know more about my career path and journey, um, I am on, on LinkedIn. I don't do as much social media, but I but I should. I do. Um, I naturalist, so follow some of my pictures on there that I'm taking here um, at the Nature Center, and um, also throughout Chicago, which we're getting ready for the City Nature Challenge. Um, um, on iNaturalist. So if you want to explore nature in your own area, that would be a good opportunity for you to join. Um, thanks again, everybody. I'll uh, stick around for a couple more minutes, see if any other questions come through. Um, but I had fun. I hope you guys did too. Um, and adios a todos. Muchísimas gracias. Um, no se olviden de, de de quienes son. Es importante que tu cultura esté representada en el ambiente. Uh, chao para todo mundo. Uh, muito obrigado a vocês. Beijos.